So good afternoon, and um, I would like uh, to first of all uh, thank, thank uh, Coach uh, Richel for his uh, welcoming words, and also I would like uh, to welcome uh, everybody here, uh, colleagues, friends, colleagues from the past, present colleagues, and uh, all the other people that are part of the community of uh, IHG Delft. What I want to do uh, today is um, to say a few words um, about uh, wicked problems, and uh, the reason why I choose actually Wicked Problems as uh, one of the titles here is that, uh, to my opinion, if uh, you're dealing and uh, working with water, you will soon find out that's about uh, wicked problems. Uh, of course, that's not uh, something completely new, but uh, I do think that it's uh, been uh, stronger and stronger uh, the case uh, if you look, um, especially in research, but maybe even uh, more strongly if you look in, in um, the practice, so what you can do with that. So uh, what I would like uh, to do is um, first say a few words about uh, why I'm here, uh, then say something about uh, wicked problems so that everybody is on the same uh, level as I am, uh, because there are also some different uh, definitions there. I uh, would like to spend some time on questions to be asked, because that's, uh, I think, one of the reasons why we are here and why we are both doing education and training and uh, research. Um, I would also like to say something about the complexity, because that's where this, this wicked side uh, comes into play again. And uh, what's happening on the global level, so what are we trying to do about that? And what are possible ways forward? Um, I will not address all the problems, I will just give uh, a couple of examples here. And then uh, last but uh, not least, uh, how can we as uh, IG Delft contribute to those uh, ways forward? And um, at the end, I would like uh, to close the meeting with uh, a, a few uh, reminders on what my ambition is. So first of all, um, I am here because uh, water for me is something that I experienced already, uh, say, when I was uh, young. I personally like uh, to swim a lot, but I also like to dive, I like to sail, I like to do uh, all the things that are related to water. And that's for me, that's the joy of water. Also, later on in life, I experienced a couple of uh, events that uh, showed me also the, the strength of water and uh, what uh, water can do to you. Uh, one example there is uh, I once uh, was measuring a discharge measurement. Hydrologists around here know something about that. Um, if you do a discharge measurement, you're very much interested to know the extremes because you're trying to create a curve that tells you something about the relationship about the water level and the discharge. So you would like to do a measurement when uh, you are either at the very low uh, extreme, so um, a less amount of water, or when there is an abundance of water, a flood. So we choose the, the flooding part. And um, I was there as, a, as an observer with a team in Burkina Faso, and um, we uh, entered the dinghy. Uh, we went across uh, the river and they tried to uh, put a, a rope across uh, the river so that they could use that as a guiding line <coughs> to do the measurements. But then while they were doing that, uh, the rope actually uh, touched the water and uh, the rope was also fixed to the dinghy. And the only thing the captain could do is ask, can everybody swim? And uh, within three seconds, the boat was uh, underwater. Luckily, everybody could swim. So at the end, you were standing on the side of uh, the river, barefooted, on the wrong side, of course, Carl's on the other side. And uh, that was uh, one of the ways how I found out what water can also mean. But another one was uh, working in uh, Siberia in the winter and uh, driving on a two-lane road over the frozen river where it showed the strength of uh, water and what it can carry. But also uh, working in uh, Agadez uh, in, in the desert and uh, seeing actually the new a uh, wave of water coming in a dry uh, valley and knowing that that is supplying water for a city like uh, Agadez and uh, measuring also how much water would then be available for a city like that. And then coming in a village after a very long drive through the desert and getting your first uh, glass or a calabas of water, sometimes with some lemon in there, showing you the joy of water or the delight of water when you get something uh, to drink. So for me, all those reasons were things why I thought it was important to work on water. And um, I think what happened then is that uh, later on in, in uh, my life, I started also to see and uh, experience what was happening 
uh, around us when we were trying to solve problems in uh, different areas. And then it was about engaging with people, talking with people, learning what the problem is, but also learning from them where solutions are and what you can do about it and what steps you can take or should not take. But also sometimes uh, you had to draw a conclusion that uh, that was not the right way forward and something was completely blocked and you had to approach it from a different way. So that, I think, was the trigger for me also a little bit to talk about wicked problems. And what you see here on the screen is actually one representation of a wicked problem. But what it shows is actually that a wicked problem has no clear uh, definition of the problem. The problem can change while you're working on it. Also, there are no clear solutions. It can be that uh, one solution may solve a part of the problem, but it may enhance uh, the problems that are related to another part, to the same system or the same uh, society. So sometimes um, you have to look at a wicked problem knowing that you will not find one single answer, that you will not find one single method that can help you to research the problem, but you have to approach it from different sides. And that's also, it makes it difficult, but it, I think it also makes it very interesting on what you can do and what you want to learn uh, from such a problem. Then related to uh, those wicked problems, there are a number of questions that you can ask yourself. So one of those questions is, uh, when does a flood become a, nu a nuisance? So for example, uh, I don't know if you experienced uh, that this morning already, but uh, walking to your car from your house is if you are walking over the street, uh, do you get wet feet? Uh, is that uh, a cause for you to go to your water manager and say, hey, I'm getting wet feet, do something about the flood? Or is that when uh, the water is knee deep or when the water is hip deep? That's uh, almost the point when children are not able to cross uh, or stand in water anymore, so then uh, life becomes threatening. Is that the point uh, where you would like to take action? Another one is water uh, scarcity. And water scarcity is often about uh, dealing with water availability, knowing how much water is there, but very much also about uh, knowing what the water demand is, knowing how you can allocate water, and uh, where in time uh, should you do that, and also at what place should you have most water available. So what are the critical moments in time and space of uh, the water demand and water availability? And related to that, is climate change playing a role in there? Is climate change causing a shift in uh, timing or a shift in the location of where water is available, but also where the need of water is? Related to those uh, questions are um, things like, what are our windows of opportunities? How and when uh, do we have enough information uh, to take a decision, to set our priorities. How much information do we need? Different perspectives come into play and how can we bring them together? So how can we enable prioritization of actions? And what about equity? Is migration driven by uh, equity imbalance? Is it uh, related to water? Of course, um, in most cases not directly, but very often indirectly, you could uh, see that there is a connection to water availability and migration. But related questions I think that are also uh, related to development, and there you come into questions like are smallholder farmers looking towards a sustainable and acceptable level of quality of life? Or are they going in a dead end street? Should we support actually smallholder farmers, or should we think about new ways how we can help them coming from a deadlock situation and giving opportunities for another development? Is that possible in every region, or should we look at uh, different solutions for different regions? So this is about the different solutions that uh, we would like uh, to look at. But if we do that, and if uh, we are thinking about uh, those uh, solutions, uh, we also very much uh, need to know what uh, the different trends are that are taking place. And uh, that's where I would like uh, to draw your attention to. So I want to walk with you to a number of trends that are taking place at the global level. The first one is uh, the trend in climate change. And the graphs that uh, you see here, uh, depict a little bit uh, what the uh, CO2 emissions are in uh, CO2 equivalents uh, per year. So it shows you actually the increase that uh, we have seen over uh, the last uh, number of years. What you also see at the end is that there is some leveling off actually of the graph, which uh, is a positive uh, sign. 
Uh, what we are aiming for, of course, is that this graph uh, goes downward, but uh, leveling off should be a first step. This leveling off is uh, mostly caused by uh, a change in uh, the um, energy production in China, and that was very much related to coal mines. And they're now shifting slowly to other uh, ways of energy <coughs> production that has a less impact on CO2 exchange. So uh, very often <coughs> climate change and CO2 emissions are related to my, uh, mitigation issues. And mitigation issues are very strongly linked to energy and energy supply. What you see here in those two graphs is on the left hand graph you see the energy uh, generation while on the right-hand graph uh, you see the cost of energy uh, productivity. And what you see also is that uh, in these graphs it's predicted that uh, the fossil uh, use of energy will uh, decrease while the use, for example, of uh, solar and also of uh, wind energy will increase and especially the solar energy will increase almost exponentially. At the same time, you see that the price of energy is uh, changing uh, rather drastically and that um, next to oil and coal being uh, fossil fuels that also the cost of nuclear uh, energy is increasing and that has to do with uh, the risks uh, assessment that are there and the investments that have been made for that. While uh, again uh, solar energy is uh, also if you look at uh, the price of energy decreasing so that will change our, our landscape uh, rather drastically but this is just uh, one trend uh, the other important part that's related uh, to climate change is uh, adaptation. So we spoke of mitigation, the other side is adaptation. And here you see four panels actually, if you look on the left hand side. On the left hand it's uh, temperature related uh, change, while on the right hand side it's precipitation related change. I put a somewhat different figure here than what you see very often, that's average temperature and total precipitation. And that has to do with the fact that uh, I think uh, for different sectors it's more important to often use at certain uh, specific indicators, in this case uh, extremely related indicators. So the two graphs on the right hand side are important if you're interested in flood management. So you would like to know a little bit about what your extreme precipitation period is, not necessarily what your total amount of precipitation is. While on the left hand side it has to do more with health related research, where you would like to know something that says what and how much um, the temperature will increase or decrease. And both heat waves but also cold waves are uh, the uh, climate phenomena that uh, cause and trigger a lot of uh, deaths or a lot of uh, diseases. So it's important to know what's happening there. In all those uh, graphs uh, you see for different RCPs uh, which tells you something about uh, the strength of uh, the uh, climate uh, change and also the strength of uh, CO2 and by that uh, the temperature change. For um, all of them you see an increase except maybe for the lowest one uh, which uh, shows you a stabling off. And uh, this is related to the temperature change and what's on the board at the moment is a temperature change uh, that we would like to keep within a two degree change and then you're talking about uh, the RCP um, say 4.5 or 8.5 or anything that's in between there. Um, we would not like to go along the 8.5 um, but uh, at the moment we are, if you look at the CO2 emissions, more on track of this 8.5 uh, RCP uh, than on the lower one where we would like to be. Now within the fifth assessment report of the IPCC they also show this graph and I think that's nice because this tells you something about what is happening and uh, what uh, sectors are engaged and if you uh, for example look at uh, the Asia box which is on your right hand side uh, this graph tells you something about what's happening in Asia and uh, what parts uh, can be attributed to climate change so what you see here is that from this study it shows that uh, the glaciers are going to be affected that there is say a high uh, degree of confidence in that uh, this uh, may happen and uh, the same is true actually for the uh, terrestrial ecosystems which has uh, the, the green symbols on the right hand side. Uh, also uh, there is uh, confidence in that something will happen with uh, floods and droughts so there will be change in floods and droughts but that's not that strongly attributed to climate change but also to other changes. And other changes that uh, may be related to that is depicted in this graph here. This is coming from uh, Iran. It shows you the groundwater level for one of the tube wells in Iran. 
and it shows you that uh, in this particular case there is a ground level lowering of half a meter per year. So every year the groundwater drops down by more than half a meter. And of course uh, it's not uh, too difficult to know that this is not a sustainable situation and it's also a situation that they would like uh, to work on. The question is then how and what uh, should you do? So I will come back uh, to that uh, later on. And I can tell you that this is not uh, the only place where this is happening. In a lot of other uh, countries around, around the world you see either a similar size of dropping groundwater or even a bigger one uh, taking place. Groundwater is uh, very important because it's uh, often the buffer of where you can take water in a dry period. So it's also about water allocation and uh, next to groundwater is also about surface water. Here I think it's good to draw your attention to what's happening uh, on the level of water treaties. Um, water treaties are on the table already for some time, but if you look at uh, say the database that uh, is there from water treaties, you will see that most of the water treaties are from before the 1970s. Of course there are still a number of them on the board that are being negotiated. But it also tells you that actually looking at uh, what we have been discussing before and the changes that have been taking place since the 1960s, 1970s, both on socio-economic changes, so meaning on water demand and uh, water use, but also in climate change, uh, it's uh, something that uh, you would like to rediscuss actually those water treaties, especially the water treaties that deal with the amount of water uh, that's been available and that's distributed among the different uh, countries that are riparian to a certain riverbed. So I do think that uh, there is a lot of attention needed to see how we can further support those negotiations that are dealing with water treaties. Again, I think uh, often with water treaties you think about transboundary issues for uh, different countries and different nations, but I do think it also starts at a much lower level. So it's also between farmers, it's in villages, it's also at district level or province level. So very often what uh, you see is that as soon as the administrative boundary is not coinciding with a natural boundary being a catchment boundary, it's already important to start thinking about how you can distribute uh, the water in there. And uh, you know that those discussions will not be very easy. Related to uh, this trend, uh, what I just described is also urbanization. And here's a graph and the red line shows you where we are at the moment, more or less. So uh, you can see for the different continents what's happening there, but uh, at the global level, uh, we also see that globalization or urbanization is um, for more than 50% uh, of the people living in uh, urban areas at the moment, and that will increase to uh, approximately more than 65% globally. Of course, in some continents, we are already past that stage. Uh, there are much higher density in uh, city areas. Related to this trend uh, is uh, the population density trend. Um, you also have a trend in social media. Uh, one of them is uh, by smartphones. This graph shows you a little bit, uh, say, the expected increase in the use of smartphones. Now, I'm not an expert in that field, but I do think that in the social media there will be other developments also taking place. But what you can account on, I think is that the interactions that we have in the communication that we have in the speed of communication that we have will only increase in the coming years. So that means that uh, we should look at what uh, that um, would mean then also for our water related uh, issues and uh, the problems that uh, that may refer to. So one other thing I would like uh, to say about uh, this trend, and just as a flow of uh, thinking about that, related also to transboundary issues and the smaller scale one, is that <coughs> if uh, you have those changes taking place, and uh, you're talking about uh, water conflicts at a certain level, it's also good to think about uh, what consequences uh, that may have or what uh, impact that may have. And uh, one of them is uh, about migration. And I think that uh, if you uh, look at migration and you look at literature, of course, uh, the influx of refugees uh, into uh, Europe is an important one. Related to that, uh, some mentioning about uh, climate change as being one of the drivers uh, of uh, this uh, migration level that uh, started. 
I think that uh, deserves uh, more research and I do think that it would also be very good and interesting to know uh, where and when it starts, at what level does it start and I think that for that reason you need to go to this much lower, much more detailed level where you would like to know uh, what, what is happening there and why people are being pushed but also how people are being pulled away. Now the push side for a part I think uh, water and also um, water availability is a reason that uh, it may push people away and you could think about the drought but you could also think about the flood. On the pool side it's also about uh, people knowing and hearing about what possibilities there are in cities and there I think social media are playing a role in uh, letting people know uh, what to do or where to go for uh, if they want to look for an, a new and a better situation for them. Uh, so I do, do think that uh, these are just two that I'm mentioning. There are many more push and pull factors. Also family is of course a very important role in the pool part. But I do think that it's important to think about and I do think that it's important to also look from the water side how and what we can contribute into that research. <coughs> If I go um, a little bit deeper into uh, complexity, the complexity of certain problems, I would like uh, to say a few words about uh, water scarcity. Um, one reason for that is that uh, um, my research site, what I'm still doing at uh, the Vue University in Amsterdam, is very much related to climate and water, and then looking at dry extremes. So that's why I take this sample, because it relates also to my personal work here. But first of all, about uh, water scarcity. Definition of water scarcity is uh, the lack of sufficient available water resources to meet water needs uh, in a region. And uh, at the moment, uh, say approximately 3 billion people are affected around the world. And uh, we do think that uh, that will increase, uh, say in the coming decades, to more than half of the world being affected by water stressed uh, situations or water scarcity situations. This doesn't mean that they are affected uh, the year through, but uh, the definition used here is that they are affected at least once a month in the year by a lack of water. Now, when do you have a lack of water? And there, uh, water scarcity may be divided into two main mechanisms there. First one being the physical water scarcity mechanism, and the second one being more economic water scarcity. And especially with the later one, I think, um, Perceptions and perspectives are playing a big role and that's why uh, you have this nice drawing here and I'm not sure if your neighbor counts the same number of sticks as uh, your neighbor on your left hand side and right hand side uh, but uh, there are some nice pictures like this where you can have completely different view on a two-dimensional picture let alone uh, problems that we are facing in the water sector where you're talking about many more dimensions than two. So, water scarcity, and what is the definition of a water drought? What you see in this drawing is on the, the left-hand side, you see the, the physical water scarcity, and on the right-hand side, you see the economic water scarcity, or the social water scarcity. Now, with the physical water scarcity, it starts uh, with rain, yeah, but it's not only about uh, rain, and uh, with rain, you can talk about the meteorological drought, it's also about how much water is uh, being used uh, by plants. So it's about the water demand. And uh, that enters the equation um, one side directly. So then you're talking about soil evaporation, but also indirectly. And then it comes through the plants and it comes to the uh, surface water deficit uh, where uh, you may have uh, evaporation playing an important role and being governed by the surface water or groundwater deficit to know how much will evaporate. What's important in there as well is how much water is stored. And so the storage of water will play a big role about the amount of water that will evaporate, but also about the water that will be available. Together with uh, the storage of water and the groundwater deficit, as well as the soil water deficit and the surface water deficit, you know what water may be used by human mankind. Now, why do I think that the water demand and socio-economic drought is very important? So just to give you an example, and that is about, um, say, what you can now buy in uh, most shops nowadays is uh, milk coming from almonds. And uh, a large part of this almond milk is uh, produced in California. And uh, what you see is actually that uh, because of this, uh, this market development and this big uh, economic demand, but maybe you can also call it a social demand, 
because people start drinking this almond milk because it's more healthier than milk coming from, from uh, cows. That demand actually increased uh, the need for water and the use of water in California to irrigate uh, almond trees and to increase production there. And so this uh, economic or social demand actually triggered a different water use in uh, a different continent. And uh, by that it also triggered, uh, say, partly the drought that was uh, experienced in California in the last number of years. Luckily, the last year they had more rain, so they partly overcame uh, this problem, but uh, it's still an issue that's on the table there and where they're thinking about, okay, how can you, you regulate uh, water and can distribute water uh, availability. Another example uh, I want to show you here is coming from South Asia. And uh, that's about, um, say, the amount of water that's needed actually for crop production in uh, South Asia. What you see in this graph actually is um, <coughs> depicted for the different colors. You see different crops that are there. But what you also see is uh, the year. So it's going actually from January to December from left to right. And you see that uh, depending on the time of year, uh, the crop needs a different amount of water. And uh, what is important here is that um, if you look, for example, at uh, the summer period, so that's in this case uh, for the months uh, April and May, then you primarily uh, need water for sugarcane uh, growth. And uh, this water, because uh, during this period there is uh, no or almost no rain, uh, you need uh, groundwater or surface water storage uh, to extract that water. If you go uh, for uh, wheat uh, production, and that's coming mainly in uh, November to uh, February, March, uh, then depending a little bit on which uh, catchment area you're in, and here uh, this study was done for three catchment areas. One was the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra. So depending a bit on which um, catchment area you, you were in, you need more water coming from either your groundwater source or your surface water source, partly uh, added by uh, rainfall uh, that was uh, coming in. Now, um, added complexity besides this distribution of water over the different crops, because behind those crops you have different users, so you're talking about farmers in the end, uh, there are also changes happening. And uh, if you look at the two big arrows, then one arrow tells you that uh, the amount of water available may change because rainfall patterns may change, so that's about monsoon variability changing and monsoon patterns changing, but also increasing in uh, rainfall intensity. Another one uh, is the shift in melt. So that's uh, mainly in the Indus uh, very important, where a large part of the water available for irrigation is coming from uh, the melt from snow and partly from ice of uh, the glaciers. So if with climate change you will get a temperature increase, that will also mean that the timing and availability of water from meltwater in the Sarifa Basin will change. And uh, that are changes where people have to take into account what that means for their crop. And then uh, you come into adaptation. One thing that I uh, want to mention there related to adaptation, that's uh, the way how you apply your irrigation. And this figure here shows you three different types of irrigation. And one is on the left hand side is surface irrigation. And then you have sprinkler irrigation and you have drip irrigation. Um, what you see is that there is a lot of subsidies at the moment to introduce drip irrigation. The big benefit of drip irrigation is that there is a water use efficiency in there. And you can see that uh, because uh, the bars that are under the x-axis are often seen as losses. And uh, the bars above it are seen as uh, gains in the sense that transpiration is very strongly related to photosynthesis and by that to your crop yield. So your yield depends on how much transpiration uh, you have, while the total amount of water, of course, are uh, those bars added to one another. Now, why is this important? Is because uh, with the surface irrigation, you also have a very big return flow. And this return flow is the amount of water that's not being used by the crop, but that's seeping to the soil and that enters again either in your groundwater system or your surface water system. If you don't take into account that by introducing a new irrigation technique, then uh, you also don't take into account that uh, other uh, people using the same water, groundwater, will have less water because of this uh, drip irrigation system. And uh, this is sometimes uh, happening because farmers uh, introducing drip irrigation systems, 
Uh, they will either enlarge their crop production in time or they will enlarge their crop production in space. And in that way, they're still using more water than they were actually using when, <coughs> when they still had uh, surface water irrigation. Sometimes it's also called uh, the drip irrigation paradox. And uh, I do think that that uh, deserves uh, some attention. Here I listed a number of uh, other uh, possibilities uh, that you can use uh, to adapt if you're looking in, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, how you can change uh, water availability and still increase uh, food production. But uh, to all of these, I think it's important uh, that uh, you think about, okay, what does that mean uh, for other users? And uh, on purpose, I put here not the word but, but the word and, because I think it's not by saying, hey, this is not possible, but it's thinking about how to use, for example, drip irrigation, but how can you do it in such a way that's also a safe, sustainable way for the other users in the catchment area. That means that uh, we are looking also at uh, what's happening on the, on the global level there. And of course, there are a couple of important things that are going on. Uh, one of them, I think, is uh, the Paris Agreement, very much related to climate change that took place, but also the follow-up discussions that were there. But the second one, I think, is the SDGs. And um, here I just picked uh, the different SDGs, and I think it's nice that uh, at IHG Delft, we put a lot of effort, of course, in SDG number six which is about uh, clean water and sanitation, but it's also about uh, sharing water and it's at boundary <coughs> issues. But if you um, look at the summary of the different projects of IHG Delft, and I strongly invite you to do that, then you will also see that there are a number of other SDGs that are also supported by what we do in the different projects. I've shown you this because I think that also shows, uh, say, the, the strength, but also the strength of water in the sense of bringing sectors together and bringing people together. But it also means that it requires a holistic and an integrated view if you want to look at uh, solutions here. That's not always easy because uh, then you enter, for example, in investment and in finance. And so um, what you see here is actually the priority areas of the Green Climate Fund. And the Green Climate Fund is one of the biggest investment uh, sources uh, meant uh, to overcome or at least uh, adjust also the agreements that were uh, put forward in the NDCs and the INDCs from the Paris Agreement, where countries could say what they wanted to do on the level of adaptation, but also in mitigation side. So what you see here is that although there are a number of topics, and on the, the left-hand side you see mainly issues related to mitigation, on the right-hand side to adaptation, but you also see that they are connected very often. And for example, urban areas represented by infrastructure and built environment as well, as on the left-hand side, uh, buildings and cities, uh, they both benefit, both from mitigation, but also from uh, adaptation investments. But if you have followed uh, the news and have followed uh, the Green Climate Fund a little bit, then you will also acknowledge that there is a big problem with attribution. And that means that uh, in a number of cases, proposals are being put forward, but they are never been financed. And one of the big reasons is that in those proposals, it's not clear if it's about development or if it's about, um, say, <coughs> solutions, measures that you want to take strongly related to climate change. Now, I think that it's very difficult to take those two apart. And if it was easy, people would have done that already. Uh, the, the issue here uh, being maybe a little bit if that we, um, as, as a society, as a global society, should rethink a little bit about how we can bring those different funds together. So how can we bring development funds together with climate funds and not start saying, okay, that is not in my part, it should go somewhere else or vice versa, because you can't disentangle them completely. So I don't think you should also try to disentangle them in your financing instruments. So I would strongly urge um, actually some more research and some more ideas about how can we bring this uh, together. As long as we don't do that, I think this uh, picture is still in place and that means that we still agree that we should do something uh, with all of us but that we are uh, strongly hampered by implying and implementing uh, possible measures. So I hope that we can change this and um, oops, now I did something wrong here. <coughs> Um, so I do hope that we can change that and I uh, would like to give uh, a couple of uh, examples uh, here uh, briefly. Um, so one of them is uh, what I think uh, could be done with uh, say, 
say, uh, distributed uh, decentralized systems. And uh, I think that's something that is uh, interesting because I do think that uh, one reason is to do that with uh, water treatment. Uh, I think that uh, water treatment for centralized systems is a very difficult one, especially because we're facing so huge uh, water quality issues. While if you would go for decentralized systems, you could approach uh, the problem a little bit more specific for a specific contaminant that you could have in the water. But another important one is that uh, you see in energy production, a lot of the renewable energies is also uh, related to distributed systems. And uh, nice examples there, I think, uh, are also taking place where you see uh, the development of mini grids. And I think also from water treatment side, uh, you can also uh, generate energy, but also in some cases you need energy. So bringing those two together, I think, would be a nice way forward. It could also mean that uh, you could have a possibility where uh, you create a real change in uh, the agricultural uh, sector by uh, making a farmer an energy producer instead of a food producer or maybe a combined producer. And there I think there are some nice developments uh, also coming from the Netherlands where you look at um, uh, greenhouses where you can have both energy production as well as food production. But I also think the combination between water treatment plants and where you look at the resources and the nutrients that come free from, uh, let's say, the, uh, the residues of the water treatment plants can be used in agriculture again. So I do think that you can uh, reinforce and strengthen those uh, combinations. If you would do something like that, it would also mean that you could reduce uh, transportation costs. And it could also mean that you can reduce investment costs because you don't have to invest on a very expensive centralized transportation systems for energy uh, but also for road transportation and also for all other uh, good transportation um, water being one of them if you would do that uh, maybe you could also decrease the losses by increasing the lifetime of the product um, this could mean that you're looking at uh, ways how you can maybe process uh, certain goods at the location because you now have energy available there but you also have the goods available there and if you would then uh, say start up a um, uh, factory that processes your goods uh, you can process them in such a way that uh, the lifetime of uh, such a product uh, may be uh, longer than it uh, used to be also if you would do that uh, you could uh, most likely extract uh, a large part of the water so you can recycle the water in the place there so you're not transporting water but you're transporting a higher quality good and by that maybe you can also increase the income of uh, the farmers and with that you get back to uh, the thing that I found important as well uh, can we know or can we say something about and can we do something about uh, migration and can we reduce conflicts so I think possibilities are there I think it needs and requires actually innovations it also requires that we look at problem something in a somewhat different way but it also means that we um, need to be able to convince people that they can do things in a different way, still having a good quality of life and, and still being able to live in a way that they would like to live. Another development uh, I see uh, taking place uh, has to do uh, with uh, research. And <coughs> what I uh, put on the graph here is the TRL uh, levels from one to nine. Uh, everybody ever been engaged in an Horizon 2020 project uh, knows this one because this is one of the, the requests that they do. You are asked nowadays to indicate uh, from which TRL level uh, you can bring the product to, to the next TRL level. And of course, uh, they would prefer that you bring it to TRL level number nine. Now, I think that uh, if you look at that, I think fundamental research is very much aimed at the fourth, first four TRL levels, at least how we were doing uh, things at the moment. And um, applied research, uh, partly also what we're doing here at uh, IG Dells, is very much related to TRL uh, 3 to 5, more or less traditionally. But what I do think that uh, we need is uh, we see a shift. And I, I think we also see a shift taking place at the universities doing fundamental research. So it's a shift downwards. So I think they're not skipping TRL 1, they're still doing that. But they're also looking at TRL 6. Uh, so uh, universities are also looking a little bit on what before we were calling applied research. So that's becoming part of integrated part of fundamental research, which I think is a good development. But it also means that for the applied research, I think we should also uh, go down. 
And I do think that uh, there's a need that we also look at the other TRL levels uh, as a, a research uh, institute and also as a research entity, and that we look at how we can bring a certain uh, new innovations uh, into the market. And I think, uh, especially if you look at uh, the later TRL levels, uh, there for me is this wicked part coming into play again, because at that point in time, uh, you have to deal very much with different stakeholders and, and with different perceptions as well as uh, different solutions. But I do think that that's uh, one way uh, how uh, we could further develop and strengthen the research that, uh, that we're doing. Now, a few words about uh, IG Delft. And um, one development that's already taking place that within uh, the umbrella of uh, capacity development, uh, we're looking at uh, research uh, education and institutional strengthening. I do think that uh, that um, is being done from a problem-based and a result-oriented uh, background. And I think that that's uh, driving us as well on what we would like to do. What I think that's needed if you want to do that is a flexible structure. And I think that flexibility uh, that should come in, in the whole building that we have over there. And I think that that's one way, or one of the things that I would like to put uh, emphasis upon in, um, say, the coming time on how can we do that. And I would like to just spend a few words on a, a couple of issues that I would like to mention. <laughs> now, first of all, um, about uh, education. And, um, there are a number of uh, developments that are taking place, so I'm not uh, saying things that are completely new here. But one of them is that uh, I think that if you look at uh, the education and training that's been given in uh, some of the countries that are also our partner countries there, then what you see is you see actually an, an, a very good development of the education and training that's given in the country itself. And so I do see students coming from uh, countries like uh, China, but also India, Iran, that are students that uh, have a real good, good uh, level of, of training and education. Um, often I think it's uh, still a little bit on the traditional way on how uh, education and training was given, but still I think it's at a, at a high level. I think that um, we should use that, and that means that, that positions, uh, institutes like IHG Delft in a somewhat different position, and we'll come back to that in a second. Another development that uh, I see is that uh, in a number of countries uh, you have an increase in, in income but also an increase in interest and to pay for their own um, say education. Traditionally, um, it's, it's changed already partly, but traditionally IC Delft is also here for developing countries and it's for the poorest of the poorest. But I do think that there's also a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, demand actually for the training that's been given by transition countries and countries that are already one step further and I do think we should open our doors also for uh, those students and interest there. That has an uh, important reason and that is something I will tell in, in the end so keep that in mind uh, if you please. If we want to do that and uh, if we are looking at what uh, demand is coming from the different countries is that you see that in a number of cases uh, governments would like their employees being trained on specific issues, also having uh, specific skills. So that means that the education and training that we are providing should maybe be streamlined and focused a bit more on where the demand is coming from and how we can adjust our training and education in such a way that, that we also comply to uh, this uh, demand. And I think that's possible, but I think that's where the flexibility comes into play. Of course, we're doing already some steps there, because one of the issues that's important for uh, those uh, governments, but also for uh, other employees or businesses, is that they don't lose their employees for a very long time. And sometimes 18 months is a bit long. And so one of the developments here is that um, the accreditation has been submitted for the 12-month master course on sanitation here. So I do think that that's a, a very nice uh, development. Of course, important to keep in mind if you can maintain the quality of education but also uh, the quality of uh, the researcher that we hope to deliver at the end and is able to do a PhD after that. But secondly, uh, we're also looking if there is a possibility to start a five-year master where it will be a master that will be given in uh, say short uh, courses over a period of five years which allows uh, the student to remain in the country and to remain working also for uh, the company that they are. So they are not extracted 
from their work uh, that long as they would be if they would come uh, to uh, the Netherlands for a period of uh, 12 months up to 18 months. So I think that that flexibility is something that I would uh, strongly support. I also think that um, IHE uh, can make a difference by off offering integrated education. And with integrated education, I mean that what we're doing is uh, we're trying to put them to the next level of, uh, say, a certain technical skill. Uh, but I think that we're also offering, and I see that happening already in the education that we're providing, but I think we can take it even a step further, that we're also looking at other skills. And that are skills related maybe to how do you start up a private business if uh, you want to do that as a the end of your PhD or MSc thesis, but also leadership skills. If somebody is going back to his government position, in most cases uh, they are uh, going back uh, to uh, maybe a production team, but we also see if we look at our alumni that uh, some alumni they grow uh, later on. So uh, we also think that it's important that they are dealing with that. But also from our own experience here in the Netherlands, but also in other countries, more and more of the people engaged in the water sector are also engaged, not only on these technical issues, but are also engaged in these discussions where you have to deal with other water users, where you have to deal with other stakeholders. And for that, I think it's also important that they learn those other skills. And I think that should go across all the different trainings that we're giving. So then uh, a little bit about research. Now, um, when you leave here, you will get a small uh, booklet. And in the back of the booklet, uh, as an annex, I put an overview of uh, all running PhD research that has been done at IHG or in collaboration with IHG. And I would like to invite you to have a look at it, because if you have a look at it, I think there are now uh, roughly 140 PhD students uh, that are active here at the Institute. You will also see the diversity in the different research that are done there. And this diversity is not only on the different things, by the way, they're all related to water, but uh, they go actually from bacteria uh, towards uh, the global scale. And so all skills are there. I think uh, they go from really very strong technical topics to uh, real social topics. I think we can add some topics there, but I also think that it shows a little bit the the, the brains and the interest and the research that's available within the institute. And I do think we should use our PhD students and our PhD research a little bit better maybe than we are doing at the moment. So looking at the valorization of uh, the research done by our PhD community, I think that would be something that at least would please me a lot. And I would uh, really like to contribute uh, to that part. So I do think that uh, um, this integration um, is also important. So that means that I think a number of the PhD students, or maybe even most PhD students, they are walking a very lonely road. And that's part of uh, doing a PhD degree. But I do think that uh, as IHG Delft, we should also try to <coughs> assure that we make some integration there and that we engage them with other colleagues that are dealing with topics that are connected to that and that we assure that uh, they know from one another and they learn also from one another what is there. So I was very happy uh, that at uh, the beginning of the week, for two days, we had the PhD um, meetings happening here where they shared uh, their knowledge, uh, not only with their uh, counterparts, but also with uh, the staff here. So I do hope that that uh, will continue happening. Uh, the third pillar here is institutional strengthening. And I think um, there um, I would like uh, to go a little bit more about uh, cross-sectoral integration. And that means that uh, I do think that uh, as IHG Delft, we should also try to engage with our partners, our partners being in, in countries mostly outside of Europe, that it should be about how can we bring people from the Ministry of Water Resources together with the Ministry of Agriculture. But it's also about if one of our colleagues who is an expert, for example, in water treatment goes to a certain place, that he keeps in the back of his mind and that uh, there are also colleagues who know a lot about uh, what happens with the water demand, for example, for agriculture. And how can you now bring this together? Sometimes we call this circular economy, but I do think there are uh, possibilities to see not only how we bring uh, people together outside of uh, Europe, but also how we can, within the Institute, bring people together to work together on, on those uh, related issues. So um, what I think 
in all that, um, I do think that um, we can't do that alone. Yeah, so I think that uh, important here is also the collaboration with other institutions. So that's another thing that uh, I think should be strengthened further. And that is that uh, we have to look and have to see how we can find a strong collaboration. I think also with the different universities here in the Netherlands, and because I think that we already have this network here also with a number of professors have a professorship at different <coughs> universities in the Netherlands. But I think we can use that uh, a bit more and we can push it a bit and see how, uh, for example, together we can address the topics that are coming from the Dutch uh, scientific agenda and how together we can bring that uh, a step forward. But also uh, maybe in uh, different proposals coming from Horizon 2020 research agenda, I think that's an interesting one to see what uh, can be done there. And I think that if we do that for an institute at IG Delft, it's also about how we can collaborate with institutions outside of uh, Europe. And uh, there are some examples there. I will just uh, name one uh, development there, and that is uh, in, happening in India at the moment. Uh, can we start up, uh, say, a new education and a research site together with uh, people from uh, private companies in India, but also related to different universities in India? And how can we do that? How can we make this step? So I think that's a path that we would like uh, to walk in the future. And I think it's an interesting one uh, to go forward. Um, one of the things is uh, for me that also creates flexibility in our financial resources that we have, in the sense that uh, next to having, um, say, very much appreciated resources coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, of course, the Ministry of uh, Science and Education, I do think that uh, we also need to look at if we can uh, come up with other possible um, ways of uh, funding the activities that we're doing. So um, with that, um, I would like uh, to say that uh, I do think that there is no single answer. I think there's also no single answer on how we walk the path towards the future. So I'm very much in favor in doing that in a way where we're developing scenarios and look at how uh, we can choose from the different steps that we take but fit in uh, different scenarios that also describe different futures for us. I think that um, is also related uh, to um, what is coming from the definition of wicked problems and that is that is very strongly related to people. And so do, I do think that uh, one of the most important parts is that you do that together and with together I mean uh, say all the people within the institute, supporting staff, academic staff and that you want to walk this path uh, with all those people there. And I do hope that uh, we can do that also with uh, the people that we are collaborating with in a large entity, either here in the Netherlands or outside of the Netherlands. So maybe with that, um, one thing uh, and my last slide here is uh, my ambition is actually to uh, reinforce uh, the IEG Dell's position, which I think is already a very strong one, a globally strong one, as a leading institute for future water leaders in a broad sense. With that, I would like to thank you for uh, your intention, attention and I would also very much like uh, to invite you for a reception uh, downstairs. So thank you very much.